بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحرير صل على محمد وآل محمد One of the greatest sins in the religion of Islam, according to the Qur'an, is spreading the fitna amongst a community and within society. <coughs> spreading problems and causing conspiracies to take place within society. And we see that fitna, it causes two people to break their friendship and start fighting with one another. It causes two families to fight with one another. It causes two cities, two communities to fight with one another. And sometimes we see that it even causes a civil war. It causes countries and nations to fight with one another. This is fitna, where a group of people, they cause problems to allow more fighting and more bloodshed to take place. And the fitna is a main contributor to the extremism that we are witnessing in society. A main contributor to any type of extremism, whether it's here in the West, or it's the type of extremism that we are witnessing in the Middle East and in the Muslim countries. Allah says in one verse, الفتنة أشد من القتل causing فتنة causing conspiracies and problems between groups of people this is worse than murder because murder you might murder one person and that's it you've just killed one person but when someone causes فتنة this person is legislating and allowing a whole nation to die allowing a whole community to break apart. And this is why the Quran refers to fitna, conspiring and conspiracies 
worse than murder. And Allah says in the Quran, وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً Be aware of the fitna, be aware of the conspiracies and the problems within your communities, within yourselves, within your society. الَّذِي لَا وَاتَّقُوا فِتْنَةً لَا تُصِيبَنَّ الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا مِنْكُمْ خَاصَّةً The problem with fitna is that it destroys everything. It doesn't just destroy the one who is the oppressor. It doesn't just destroy the life of one person. It destroys the life of a whole community. And we've seen this happen. Today you look in some countries in the Middle East, you see that now the whole country is destroyed. There's nothing left from that country. Because one group of people decided to cause fitna. Or you see within a family, within family relationships, within social relationships, Sometimes one problem, it could cause the whole family to break apart. And many people do not talk to one another. Many people cannot tolerate one another. At any level, fitna is worse than murder because it breaks apart the community and it breaks apart the society. And when we look at the Islamic history, when we look at the Muslim situation today, we see that we are living in a time of great fitna. We are living in a time where there is a great conspiracy going on amongst the Muslims. And it's destroyed the lives of many people. Today you look at these refugees, where did they come from? Millions of refugees, they all have to leave their country and they have to go and live somewhere else. They have to leave their homes, their family, have to, their children, they have to leave their schools and their whole life just to go somewhere else. Who caused this? This is, a, this is a fitna. It's given the religion of Islam a bad name. Yesterday we spoke about Sharia law. Today we want to talk about the reasons. Why do people resort to extremism? Why is there extremism within the Muslim land and within the Muslim community? Why is there fanaticism? It's destroyed many lives. You see even some women, they have become slaves, Muslims, using the Quran and using the name of Rasulullah, using the religion of Islam, they have enslaved other people. You see the ways that they kill, the ways that they butcher other people. You don't even know where they think of these, where they get these ideas from. One time you see them, they're drowning someone to death. Another time you see them, they're burning someone alive. Another time they attach explosives to someone's body and they blow it up. Where do they get this from? And worst of all, it's in the name of the religion of Islam. And this is the biggest fitna that we are living in today. This is the biggest conspiracy, the biggest problem that we as Muslims and as a whole society is, has to deal with today. And yesterday I mentioned how their acts are all un-Islamic. It has nothing to do with the religion of Islam. But today someone might ask, how? How have some groups of Muslims reached that level? Reached that level of extremism? Where they use the religion, they use the Quran, they use the hadith of Rasulullah to carry out violent Crimes against humanity and against society. How does that happen? The Quran is a peaceful book. You compare the Quran with the other books, you see that it is the most peaceful books. You compare the life of Rasulullah. Look at the life of Rasulullah. See how peaceful he was. He was sent as a mercy to mankind. How is it that there are people in the name of the religion of Islam carrying out these violent, cruel acts? There are reasons for this. One of the most important and one of the main reasons for extremism in society, for this fitna that we are seeing, is ignorance. And I've spoken about this many times, but the Quran has also spoken about this. The Quran, the first thing it came, it told people to educate yourself, learn. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, many times he told people to educate themselves. But you see today, 
there's a big group of ignorant people within society. And unfortunately, the ignorant people, they are very easily exploited. Anyone can come and fool an ignorant person. But if someone is educated, if someone truly knows their religion, if someone truly knows the life of Rasulullah, they're not going to be fooled easily. But when someone is ignorant, anyone can come, sit on a mambar, and say, this is what Rasulullah said, this is what the Quran says, this is what the Quran refers to, and they go and they fool people. And this is what leads to conspiracies, and this is what leads to extremism. So, ignorance. And you know what's worse than ignorance? It's when someone is ignorant, yet they think that they are knowledgeable. They think that they know. Jahal murakkab. When someone is ignorant, but they do not know that they are ignorant. And this is the problem that we are dealing with. Many people, they think they are on the haq. They think they are on the right path. And they have closed all doors. They don't even look at anyone else. They don't even want to listen to anyone else. Just like the people of Prophet Nuh. They used, when he used to speak to them, they used to close their ears so that they don't listen to the haq. Today, the days of Muharram, you find their speakers, they tell people, don't listen to the majalis of Ashura. Don't allow yourself. Don't listen to any lecture uh, regarding Imam al Hussein, regarding Ashura, regarding what happened to the family of Rasulullah. So this is to keep people in the state of ignorance. And unfortunately, it's caused many people who are ignorant, they're treated as sheep. You go and you see in many countries, they're, they listen to anything that the speaker is saying without questioning the person. Is this the religion of Islam that Rasulullah brought for us? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi brought a religion that is logical so that we question it, so that we come to reason. With reason, we come to faith and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you see that there are groups of people who are treated just like sheep. And that's it, you tell them go this way, they go that way. Go this way, do this, they do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these people in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ ذَرَأْنَا لِجَهَنَّمَ كَثِيرًا مِنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنْسِ In Jahannam, in the hellfire, there is a lot of jinn, and ants and humans. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has gifted them with a heart. The heart is not just the physical heart. The heart is the ability to make decisions, choose, to see what is right. The heart here refers to the soul. It refers to the feelings and the emotions. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا they have eyes, but they do not see with those eyes. They have, they have ears as well. Their ears, they work very well, but they do not listen. Those are like the animals. No, 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 no. They're not like the animals. They're worse than the animals. Because the animals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given them the intellect. The ability to choose. Those are the ones who are living in a life of ghafla, not realizing what's going on, easily fooled. And unfortunately, when we look at the Muslim community, we see there are many people that fall into this category. Many people. We hear Imam al Hussein, the grandson of Rasulullah, was killed on the land of Karbala. But then you have one speaker. He goes and he says, Hussein, he was killed by the sword of his grandfather. Meaning that the, the Yazid, he had the right to kill Imam al Hussein. And then you find people not complaining, not saying anything, not objecting. Those are the ones who are living in a state of ghafla. They're not realizing that they're being fooled. They're not using that intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them. And you see that many speakers, many so-called scholars, they use the Qur'an, they use the hadith of Rasulullah in order to fool people. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَكْفَالُهَا Do they not ponder? 
Do they not realize? Is the Quran just so, just so I read it without understanding, without actually using the teachings of the Quran in my life? And we see one of the main reasons for extremism within these groups is that they are taking the literal meaning of the Quran. The literal meaning of the Quran, they're taking it without having anyone do tafsir of the Quran for them. Allah says in the Quran, هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابِ مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَإِبْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلَهِ Allah says clearly in the Qur'an that there are two categories of verses. There is the verse that is muhkam, that is very clear. Anyone understands this. You bring a child, you tell him, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ اللَّهُ الصَّمْ It's very clear. It doesn't require, doesn't require too much thinking. Muhkam. And then there's another group of verses. These are mutashabah. These verses are not so clear. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ The ones who have diseases in their hearts, spiritual diseases. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنْ إِبْتِغَاءَ الْفِتْنَةِ وَإِبْتِغَاءَ تَأْوِيلَهِ They use the verses that are ambiguous, the verses that are not so clear, in order to cause fitna, in order to mislead other people. In order to divide the ummah, in order to cause problems within the ummah. And this is exactly what we are witnessing today. The Quran. Now someone might come and ask, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring the Quran that is confusing? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not just make the Quran all of it muhkam, all of it very clear? There are many answers to this. One of them is that this is what makes the Qur'an a miracle. If it was clear, it would have been like a newspaper. I get it, I read it, and then I throw it. I'm not going to pick it up anymore. The Qur'an, there are some verses that are mutashabah, some verses that are muhkam, so that I continue going back to the Qur'an. And then, a second reason, a very important reason, is so that we go back to the experts of the Qur'an. So that we go back to the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they are the ones who have the right to bring the tafsir of the Qur'an. They are the ones who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them the knowledge of the tafsir of the Qur'an. And those are the Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa salam. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. However, there is a group of people, they don't want to go back to the experts. They say, we're just going to take the literal meaning of the Qur'an, whatever we get out of it, and that's it, we don't need experts. I, I could be an expert regarding the Qur'an, anyone could be an expert regarding the Qur'an. But you see that this causes a problem. Taking the literal meaning, and we will come and see what kind of problems are caused because of this. However, this literal meaning, the the literal meaning of the Qur'an right now, it's being used by the Salafi thinking. They come and they take the literal meaning and they say, they follow exactly what the literal meaning says. But did that start with the Salafis? No. That did not start with the Salafis. You see that that act of neglecting the Ahlul Bayt and neglecting anyone who can come and explain the Qur'an, this took place on the deathbed of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa When Rasulullah, he told the Muslims, he told the Muslims, bring me a pen and a paper, a pencil and a paper, so that I write for you, so that I tell you something that you will never be misled after me. There was a man amongst them. He said, inna rajula la yahjur. The man referring to Rasulullah is hallucinating. Rasulullah is hallucinating. He's mad. He's gone mad. That means that even if he says anything, we're not going to listen to it because right now he's in a state of hallucination. You see the disrespect towards Rasulullah. And then he said something. He said, The book of Allah is enough for us. We don't need anything else. You see that that was the first step 
that neglected anyone and did not allow the anyone to come and explain the Quran. And that's what led Muslims to take the literal meaning of the Quran. Because they closed the door in front of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. They closed the door in front of Amir al-Mu'mineen, in front of the Ahlul Bayt who the Quran came down in their homes. They are the ones that have the knowledge of the Quran. They are the ones who understand the Quran. Amir al-Mu'mineen, this is the hadith of Rasulullah that all of the Muslims accept. Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babuha. I am the gate, I am the city of knowledge and Ali is its gate. Why did you close that gate? Why did you not allow the Muslims to have the knowledge and take the knowledge from Amir al-Mu'mineen? Because he said, Yakfina Kitabullah. Our, the book of Allah is enough for us. We don't need anything else. This is what caused the extremism and the problems to take place. That day, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he came out crying. He came out of the room crying. He says, Ar-Raziyah, kullu Ar-Raziyah, ma hala bayna Rasulullah wa kitabah. He says, our disaster and our downfall is what caught, what stopped Rasulullah from writing his wasiyah. Writing. He says, let me tell you something that you will never be misled after me. But someone tells him, we don't need to know that. You are hallucinating. This is one of the reasons of the fitna. And you see that this ban, there was an official ban on writing hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Someone might say, why? What was wrong for someone, anyone who came after the death of Rasulullah to say, I heard Rasulullah say this, this person would be beat up. And this person would not be allowed to narrate the hadith of Rasulullah. And this law was enacted by the first Khalifa and the second and the third until Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Until Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he came and he allowed the writing of the hadith, Tadween al Hadith. You could go and look this up. Mana' Tadween al Hadith. This took place during the time after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. No one was allowed to come and say, Rasulullah said this and Rasulullah said that. That's why you come and you look at the books of the Muslims and the Sunni school of thought, you see that. The books, they came many years after Rasulullah. We don't have a book that came immediately after the death of Rasulullah. You come and you look at Bukhari, you look at Muslim, you look at Ahmed ibn Hanbal, you see that they all came many years after Rasulullah. Because there was an official ban by the Umawi government on the writing of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And you see that this is what caused many people to be misled. Because many people, they don't know who the scholars are. They can't go to the scholars, the scholars meaning the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt, and people began to res resort to taking the literal meaning of the Quran or doing Qiyas and other forms of reaching a conclusion. And we see that many problems emerged because of this reason. Many problems that we are witnessing today. And this is how you see extremism rise. There's a verse in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, la tattakhidu al-yahuda wal-nasara awliya. O you people who believe, do not take the Jews and the Christians as awliya. Now, you go and you open the Quran, the English translation of the Quran, by some of the prominent ones here. You, got, you come and you see it says, O oh, you people who believe, do not befriend the Jews and the Christians. Now, is this truly what Allah wants to say? No. But you see that because of the lack of knowledge, they have reached this conclusion. And you see that the Muslims fell in this problem at least two times. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, in one occasion, he raised the hands of Amir al-Mu'mineen on the day of Ghadir, and he said, Man kuntu mawlah, fahada aliyun mawlah. They come and they say, Rasulullah, he stopped all of these people, just to tell them, Rasulullah, Ali ibn Abi Talib is my friend. Did he truly mean friend here, or did he mean leader here? Rasulullah meant leader. 
And here in this verse, it also means do not take the Jews and the Christians as leaders. As leaders, do not take your faith from them. It doesn't, it doesn't mean do not take them as friends. Because this contradicts other verses of the Quran. But you see that when one time you come and you change a meaning of a word, Mawla, it could either mean leader or it could also mean friend. But on the day of Hadir, Rasulullah meant leader. Or else why would he stop over a hundred thousand Muslims in the heat of that day just to tell them Ali ibn Abi Talib is my friend? Is this all that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wanted to do? No, he meant leader. And in this verse it also means leader. But you see that when there is lack of knowledge of the Quran, mistakes will emerge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the verse, لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقصدوا إليهم Allah says, Allah does not stop you from showing love and compassion towards non-Muslims. As long as they're not kicking you out of your homes, as long as they're not fighting you, there's nothing wrong with becoming a friend with a non-Muslim. But you see that when someone has the lack of knowledge, they don't know how to do tafsir al-Qur'an bil Qur'an. They don't know how to bring two verses of the Qur'an together. And it causes many problems. So here Allah says, do not take your religion. Meaning as religious leaders, as role models where you take your religion from them. You have your own sharia. You have Rasulullah. You have the Qur'an. You have the sunnah of Rasulullah. You don't need to go and take your religion from other groups of people. And of course, this is not only about the Christians and the Jews. Allah even says this about your own family. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, la tattakhidu aba'akum wa ikhwanakum awliya in istahabbu al-kufra al iman Even your own family, even your parents and your brothers and your siblings, do not take them as awliya. If they chose the kufr over iman. If they chose blasphemy over iman, do not take them as leaders. Do not take your religion and your faith from them. This is all that the verse is saying. But the problem is, when you come and you take the literal meaning of the Qur'an, it will cause problems. And these problems, they lead to types of extremism that we are seeing today. Another example. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u al-Rasul wa uli al-amri minkum. O you people who believe, obey Allah and obey the Prophet and obey the uli al-amr, the ones who have command over you. Now here, you see many groups of Muslims, they say yes, we will follow Allah and we will follow the Prophet and we will also follow anyone who is sitting on the throne. Anyone who is a king, anyone who claims to be a khalifa, anyone who is a president, this person, I have to follow this person. And you see there are many ahadith, many narrations that we do not accept. They say, follow anyone, even if this person is a fajr, even if this person is a wicked person, even if this person is a drunkard, go ahead and follow this person. That's why you say, that's why you see them saying, Yazid, he was a legitimate leader, even though he was a drunkard. All Muslims agree that he was a drunkard. But they say he was a legitimate leader because he had that Amr. And Muslims therefore had to follow him. Why do people reach this conclusion? Because they take the literal meaning of the Qur'an and they do not know how to bring verses of the Qur'an together. Allah says in another verse in the Qur'an, Allah says who the Mawla is. إنما وليكم الله ورسوله والذين آمنوا الذين يقيمون الصلاة ويؤتون الزكاة وهم راكعون. You have to bring the verses of the Quran together. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. You think he just says anyone who comes, anyone who comes and he's sitting on the throne, anyone who considers themselves a king or a leader, this person is truly a leader? No. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala does not mean that. Because you come and you see other verses of the Qur'an. Other verses of the Qur'an, they come and explicitly say who is the leader. And Allah says in the Qur'an, إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً I am the one who chooses the Khalifa. 
In another verse, Allah says, لا ينال عهدي الظالمين A ظالم cannot take this position. So, is it anyone that just comes and assumes the position, this person has a religious leadership? No. But that, people reach that conclusion when they have the lack of knowledge of the Qur'an. Where anyone, even if this person is a criminal, even if this person kills and oppresses, they say his leadership is shari. One day, Marwan, he saw Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, this great companion of Rasulullah. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he was sitting over the grave of Rasulullah. Marwan, he came and he began to kick him. He told him, get up. You are, you are speaking to the rock and you are speaking to the stone. The same, the same type of acts that we see carrying out today by the Wahhabis and the Salafis. He tells him, get up, you're speaking to the stone. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he turns around and he looks at Marwan ibn al-Hakam and he tells him, I am not, my intention is not to turn to the stone, my intention is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then he said, لا تبكو على الإسلام إذا وليه أهله ولكن ابكو عليه إذا وليه غير أهله Do not cry for Islam when the right person assumes and has the leadership but cry for Islam Feel sorry for Islam when the wrong person, a person like Marwan takes power a person like Muawiyah takes power a person like Yazid takes power This is when you have to cry for the religion of Islam. So, a reason for extremism and problems is that people, they take the literal meaning of the Quran and that causes extremism and more fitna and more problems. And same goes with the hadith. When it comes to the narrations, the narrations, they should also not be taken to its literal meaning immediately. Sometimes there are different sets of narrations. There are many narrations. You have to come and bring them all together in order to reach a conclusion. But sometimes you see, some people, they take one hadith and they rely on that hadith and they're going to kill other people and justify the killing and the oppression of other people because of one hadith that who knows if it's even right or wrong. There's a hadith of Rasulullah, if we were to accept this hadith, it says that whoever says the shahada before he dies, this person will go immediately to heaven. Anyone who says, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, before he dies, he will go to heaven. Now, should this hadith be accepted with anyone? Anyone who, someone who is a sinner, someone who his whole life he's been living as a tyrant, but before his death, he says the shahada, this person is going to go to heaven? Is this, does this go with the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And you see when Saddam was killed, when Saddam was executed, some people, they said, yes, he's going straight to heaven. Because his last words were, ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Now, does this make sense with the mercy of Allah, with the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah says in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَجَزَاؤُهُ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدًا فِيهَا وَغَضِبَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَلَعَنَهُ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُ عَذَابًا عَظِيمًا You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ignore this verse just because one person who was killing so many people, he caused millions of people to die through his wars, through his chemical weapons and killing people. You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just going to take him to heaven? So, you have to come and bring all of the verses, all of the ahadith together. In another verse, Allah says, إِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ كَانَتْ مِرْصَادًا لِلطَّاغِينَ مَآبَ You think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ignore his justice? One of our usul al-deen is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that Allah is just. Allah is not going to allow an oppressor, a tyrant, to go, to have his oppression go unpunished. But you see that these are the tactics 
that some use in order to fool people, in order to create extremist thoughts. Today, the person who's going and blowing himself up and killing innocent people, he follows this hadith. They say, yes, no matter what kind of a life I've been living, I've been living a sinful lifestyle, whatever I do, but then, before I blow myself up, I'm going to yell, Allahu Akbar. And you see that this word, the statement, Allahu Akbar, it's, so, it's such a great statement, but when you hear them saying it, and when you hear them doing it, performing these evil acts and saying Allahu Akbar, you feel sad and you feel sorry for this Allahu Akbar. This is what Rasulullah used to say. This is what the Imams used to say. But you see someone who's a terrorist, someone who's so filthy, someone who is very far from the religion of Islam, they say Allahu Akbar. And they go and they blow themselves up and kill other people. Or saying the Shahada, no matter what kind of a lifestyle they're living. This is extremism. This is a reason for extremism because people are uneducated. Because people do not have the knowledge. Anyone that says the Shahada will immediately go to paradise? No. There are conditions. There are conditions. For our scholars, they say that this is one of the conditions of entering paradise. Just like a, for example, a job application, they'll tell you that you have many requirements that you need. One of the requirements is to say the shahada. But there are other requirements as well. And of course, there is a very important requirement when you come in, when you take this and you merge it with other ahadith, you see the hadith al-muhkam, the hadith that is accepted, the hadith that has a strong chain of narrations, it is accepted before a hadith that does not have a strong chain of narrations. And one of those narrations that have a strong chain of narrations is a hadith referred to as al-silsila al-dhahabiyya by Imam al-Rada alayhi salam. He says, I heard from my father, who heard from his father, who heard from his father until Rasulullah, until Jibra'il, until the Qalam, from Allah, كَلِمَةُ لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ حِصْنِي فَمَنْ دَخِلَ حِصْنِي أَمِنَ مِنْ عَذَابِي The saying, لَا إِلَٰهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ is the sanctuary, it's the fort, it's a protection. Whoever enters that protection, they will be saved from the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the hadith is incomplete. Then the Imam, Imam al-Rada alayhi salam, he told his companions, بِشَرْطِهَا وَشُرُوطِهَا وَأَنَا مِنْ شُرُوطِهَا لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ It's easy to say, however it has many conditions, it has many requirements. It's easy to say, but difficult to act upon. He says it has conditions, and one of the conditions is Imam al-Rada, believing in the Imam, believing in all of the Imams. So this was the first reason, the ignorance. The second reason is al-alim idha fasad. Sometimes you see a community, it could be misled. It could go the wrong way because someone who considers himself a alim, someone who considers himself a scholar, but this person inside, he's a fasiq, he's a fasid, he's corrupt. Wearing the clothes of an alim, yet this person is not an alim. This person has evil intentions, wrong intentions. Rasulullah he was asked, Man shirarun nas, what are the worst people? Rasulullah's reply was, Al ulama idha fasidu. The ulama, if they have gone wrong. Of course, they are also the best of the people if they have not gone wrong. But if an alim has gone wrong, then that could cause disasters in the ummah because there's many ignorant people and this person easily, he could mislead many people. Bring people to the wrong path. You look at our history, it's filled with ulama, people that knew. They know where the haq is and where the batil is. Yet they decided to divert the ummah. They decided to mislead people. The khawarij that stood against Amir al-Mu'mineen, they knew Amir al-Mu'mineen was the rightful Imam. But they began to accuse him of kufr. And they, be, they turned against the Imam of their time. 
And history is full of examples of people who claim to be knowledgeable. Sometimes you see them, they probably have the Qur'an memorized. They know how to recite the Qur'an with a beautiful voice. But then you see that this person has gone wrong. And we see many examples of this. You see these muftis, the muftis in these governments in the Middle East. And subhanAllah, I don't know why they're all blind. Every time you see one is talking, they have to be blind. The Ibn Baz, al Shaykh, anyone that you see them, they're blind. SubhanAllah, maybe this is a sign that if he has a blind vision, he also has a blind heart. He comes and he says, and this is a few days ago, every year in Ashura he says this. Every year in Ashura he says this, the one from al Shaykh. He said, Hussein, you should not cry for Imam al Hussein. And Yazid was the rightful leader and Hussein was killed because he stood against the rightful leader of his time. Why would someone say something like that? What would you answer Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa On the day of judgment, how can you stand in front of Rasulullah when you say the day of... They don't only say you should not cry. They say the day of Ashura is a day of Eid, a day of holiday. And this is why you see them on the day of Ashura. They're going to tell their followers. And unfortunately, there are many ignorant people. They tell you, you have to fast. Thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings of the day of Ashura. This is when a scholar has gone wrong, you see that this is what happens. And the history is full of examples. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Imam al Hussein, he was killed because there were some scholars. There was a Qadi, Shurayh al Qadi, he was a judge in Kufa. He issued a fatwa against Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Just like you see them issuing fatwas today. There were people who were assuming the role of a leader that actually issued a fatwa against Imam al Hussein. Telling people, go and fight Imam al Hussein. Yazid is the rightful Imam. History is full of examples. There was a man who, used, who was a Sahaba of Rasulullah. And many Muslims in Sham at that time, they used to see anyone who's a Sahaba, anyone who's a companion of Rasulullah, we have to honor this person. We have to revere this person. This man by the name of Samarah ibn Jundab. This man, he was a companion of Rasulullah. He came to Sham. Muawiyah told him, Oh Samarah, you're a companion of Rasulullah. People will listen to you. Like the sheep, they listen to their... They're the one who's telling them, go this way and that way, the shepherd, they will also listen to you. He tells, he tells Samara, oh Samara, I want you to go out in public and stand on the manbar and tell people that this verse, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبُكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِهِ وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ وَإِذَا تَوَلَّى سَعَى فِي الْأَرْضِ لِيُفْسِدَ فِيهَا وَيُهْلِكُ الْحَرْثَ وَالنَّسْلِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُحِبُّ الْفَسَادِ There is a group of people, a person that causes fitna and he just wants to cause fasad and he wants to cause chaos and problems in society. He tells him, I want you to go out in front of the people and tell them that this verse came down referring to Ali ibn Abi Talib. That it was Ali ibn Abi Talib who wanted to cause fasad. He was the one who wanted to cause. He was the one who wanted to cause problems within society. So Samara, he told Muawiyah, "How much are you going to pay me for this?" Muawiyah told him, "I'll pay you one hundred thousand dirhams." Samara replies, he tells him, "No." I'm going to be selling my afterlife. I'm, by doing this, I will not go to heaven because this is a lie. I want more. He tells him 200,000 dirham, 300,000 dirham. Finally, he takes 400,000 dirhams and then he goes out in the public and he tells people that this verse came down upon Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is al alim ida fasad. Someone who knows, yet this person has gone astray. Salla ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.
And the third reason is when people neglect the Quran. The third reason there is extremism and people have got been misled and there's fanaticism is when people have left the Quran and left the interpreters of the Quran and those are the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam. Those are the ones that explain the meanings of the Quran. When you leave the Ahlul Bayt, well, you're not going to find the leader that has the mercy and the compassion and the love and the knowledge and the understanding and the Iman that the Ahlul Bayt have. You're going to find a leader that will mislead you. A leader that will bring you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is what leads to fitna. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam she went out in front of the Muslims after they decided to keep Ali ibn Abi Talib in the house, after they had given bay'ah to Ali ibn Abi Talib just 70 days ago. Day of Khadir and the, and the, and the martyrdom of Rasulullah, there's 70 days in between. They gave their bay'ah and then 70 days later they ignored and they neglected that bay'ah. They told her, we're trying to not cause fitna. We're trying to bring and appoint a leader so that we do not cause a fitna amongst the community, amongst the Muslims. She tells them, ابتداراً زعمتم خوف الفتنة ألا في الفتنة سقطوا وإن جهنم لمحيطة بالكاذبين. She tells them, you tried to avoid fitna, but you brought the ummah in the fitna, and in this conspiracy, and in this problem, by leaving Ali ibn Abi Talib. The role of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum salam was always there to defend the religion of Islam, and defend the Imams. And tonight, as we remember the son of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, Al Qasim. Imam al Hassan, he lost at least three of his sons. They were killed on the day of Ashura. Three of his sons. But we remember Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. We remember Al Qasim in honor of his father, Imam al Hassan. Today, you see that Al Qasim, he has visitors, but Imam al Hassan does not have visitors. Al Qasim, he has a shrine with Imam al Hussein and with the companions. Millions of visitors they visit him and Imam al Hussein every year. But Imam al Imam al Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, there is no dome over his grave. Let us cry for Imam al Hassan and cry for Al Qasim alayhi salam on the night of Ashura, the night of the tenth of Muharram. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he told all of his companions, if you stay with me, you will be killed. He tells them, leave. If you want to leave, go ahead. They all stayed. But they came. They were talking to the Imam al Qasim. He tells Imam al Hussein, oh Amma, al Qasim was 13 years old. He had not been married yet. He was 13 years old. He was young. He tells Imam al Hussein, oh Amma, oh my dear uncle. Will I also be killed tomorrow? Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he wanted to test the faith and test the thinking of Al Qasim. He tells him, Ya Bunay, how do you see death? Kayfa tar al mawt? He tells him, Ya Amma, fi nusratika ahla min al asal. Oh, my dear uncle, in your aid, Death is sweeter than honey. Imam al Hussein begins to cry and he tells him, O oh Qasim, you will be killed tomorrow. And do you know who else will be killed? My son, the six month old Ali al Azgar, will also be killed tomorrow. On the day of Ashura, Al Qasim came to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He asked for permission to go and fight. Imam al Hussein refused. It was very difficult for Imam al Hussein to allow Al Qasim to go and fight.
I took care of you after the death of my brother Imam Al Hassan. How could I see you go like this? Al Qasim kept insisting until Imam Al Hussein allowed him to go and fight. Hamid ibn Muslim, one of the narrators, he says, غلام, We saw a young man come out. His face was as bright as the moon. He came, he began to hug his uncle. He asked for permission. He says, I saw Imam al Hussein saying his farewell to Qasim. Imam al Hussein and al Qasim, they both began to cry until they both fell on the ground. Imam al Hussein tells Qasim, go and say your farewell to your mother Ramla and the woman, your aunt, and your sisters and your family. The woman, they came out telling him, Ya Qasim, irham ghurbatana. Ya Qasim, irham wa'adatana. You will leave us, you are a young man. How can you go and die like this at a very young age? Lizma terja basikana. And then he goes out carrying his sword. He is walking he, with full might and bravery. He begins walking towards the enemies. They don't know who he is. So he introduces himself. He says, Hamid ibn Muslim says, we saw a beautiful young man come out to fight. They began to fight him. They began to approach him. Suddenly, he says, the sandal strap broke. He ducked down to fix his sandal. A man, a wicked man, struck Al-Qasim on his head. Al-Qasim fell on the ground. Imam al Hussein said, Ya Bunay, Ya Uzzu ala ammika an tad'uahu fala yujibuk, aw yujibuk fala yu'inuk, ba'dan li qawmin qataluk, qasmuhum yawm al qiyamati jaddika wa abuk. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam carried al Qasim, he brought him back to the tent so that his mother can cry. Imam al-Hussein, he stood 
between Ali Al Akbar and Qasim, crying one moment for Ali Al Akbar, another moment for Qasim. Then Ramla, the mother of Qasim, she was embarrassed to enter the tent because Imam Al Hussein was crying in there. As Imam Al Hussein left the tent, she came in and she began to cry. Oh Qasim, you have left us. I want you to say your farewell. I want you to say salam to your grandmother Fatima. Tell her I left my mother alone in Karbala. I left her with the women all alone in Karbala. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Al Ali al Azim. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Ya Allah, let us raise our hands in dua. Nas'aluka Allahumma wa nad'uuk bismika al-azim al-a'zam al-a'azzil al-ajal al-akram Ya Allah Ya Allah, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim Ya Muqallib al-Qulub Thabit Qulubana ala deenik Allahumma khfir lil-mu'minina wal-mu'minat الأحياء منهم والأموات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد